Welcome to week six. We are finally taking our first deep dive into a policy theory. And this first one is, as you can see here, multiple streams framework. Multiple streams framework is a good first theory to start with uh, for a few reasons. One is that in some ways it can seem um, a little bit intuitive um, that these things occur kind of in different streams and then come together only when you can kind of check certain boxes. Also, I think it helps us understand uh, theories and frameworks that come after. So it'll make sense to have this one kind of here up front. What I'm going to do in this lecture will kind of overlap a little bit with the reading because of what I'm going to do is lay out the broad brushstrokes of the theory with go without going into a lot of the details that the reading goes into. I will save that for the reading and then for your reading summaries. Instead, what I will do here and likely for all of the kind of discrete theory videos that follow is kind of give you the, the fundamentals and maybe a new set of packaging um, so that you can be assured that you understand them as you move forward and then to let the readings kind of talk to the um, talk to the specifics and maybe the limitations of all of those frameworks as well. So let's jump in. To better understand the theory that we're studying this week, and, and I will try and do this with all of our theories, I want to put it into kind of some broader context. What is the theoretical backdrop um, against which this theory um, can be um, placed and ultimately distinguished? And here, what we have to understand is the difference between kind of traditional decision theory models and um, what in this case we'll call the garbage can models of decision making. So rational decision making um, is, is kind of thought of in this traditional decision way. And you will often see this in a lot of your classes in this program that we should do kind of these typical cost benefit analyses that we can weigh out the options in very concrete ways by assigning them certain values. So we can go through, identify the outcomes, determine their relative values, determine the probabilities that um, will result from each course of action, and then sort of do a kind of a mental multiplication of the values times the probabilities and get an expected value that we can then choose from um, to make the best decision possible. That's this traditional theory of decision making. But multiple streams theory comes from kind of a branch of this garbage can model um, thinking, which is that the traditional decision theory just does not fit real life. That real life is more like uh, kind of organized anarchy and that problems, solutions, and participants can be thought of to exist separately and be evolving at different paces all at the same time and that they may flow together to make decisions at certain points in time but it's not as um, it's not as well laid out and purposeful as kind of the traditional models would argue. Um, and ultimately, what these these theories and, and multiple streams theory, theory fits into this um, says that these streams only can result in change when opportunity arises. Um, and so what comes out of the mix, whether in garbage can model of decision making, you're talking about kind of the decision itself or in multiple streams uh, framework, we're often talking about getting something on the agenda. Whatever comes out of that is the result of these things coming together for a moment in time. So multiple streams framework argues that agenda setting and also decision making more broadly is not an exercise in rational problem solving, as the traditional um, theory would argue, but rather kind of work done within the streams that happens to come together at certain points in time. So with that in mind, let's take a brief overview of this multiple streams framework. In multiple streams, we know a few things. One is that we have these three streams within which 
um, things exist simultaneously. We have the problem stream where the perceptions of problems uh, change and become redefined, the policy stream where policy alternatives are developed in policy communities, and the political stream which we can think of as an elected and appointed officials bargaining and competing for power. Um, ultimately, what happens is that these streams become coupled um, either because of some certain events or um, certain events plus the work of what we call policy entrepreneurs and a window of opportunity opens. When this window of opportunity opens, there is the chance, not the certainty, for either a policy output or if we're talking about setting the agenda, getting an item on the agenda. So the major question for this framework is why and when do these streams come together? When does this window of opportunity work uh, um, to actually open? And then when does it work to actually have some sort of output on it as well? So let's talk about these streams. Um, they are three distinct um, kind of arenas for uh, thought and they may exist um, kind of right butting up against each other and there is some crossover as we will talk about as well but these are more theoretical in nature than necessarily practical it's not like people who work on policy go you know say oh I'm gonna go work at my policy stream now um, but this is a theory of how these things work so the first is the problem stream and this is where perceptions of problems change and become redefined and problems are these conditions that deviate from the, an ideal or desired state. So we determine that government action is needed to resolve them. But that doesn't really define a whole lot because a lot of things deviate from ideal and we just don't see them as relevant. What we need to actually bring them to the forefront in this policy stream and make them ready for coupling with another stream are, are one of these three things. Indicators, and indicators can be something like um, rates of new home ownership or unemployment um, claims or, or any kind of economic or other kind of indicator, you know, environmental indicators. All of those kind of focus attention on a specific area uh, or on a specific issue. Then we have focusing events, which are sudden, actually quite rare, and at least uh, potentially harmful, meaning we have the potential for harm to human life, and are known uh, to both policymakers and the public. So these are things that kind of focus our attention on an issue. And then finally, feedback. Um, there may be feedback within or about existing programs and policies that may direct attention to specific conditions. For example, if we find out that a policy is not working well um, and there becomes a lot of concern about this, this is where this feedback may become important. What I mean by ready for coupling means when another stream becomes ready, if you have kind of these things that are bringing a problem to the forefront, the problem stream becomes ready uh, for you to move into that window of opportunity. So we're going to see how each stream becomes sort of ready for coupling uh, throughout uh, this discussion here. The next stream is the policy stream. Policy alternatives, kind of what we could possibly do, right? P potential solutions are developed in these policy communities. Policy communities are not, again, <laughs> identified as policy communities when they're kind of an action, but rather a loose connection, usually of people in government, people in interest groups, academics, researchers, consultants, etc., who actually work together um, to try and develop alternatives to, um, to different policy problems that exist, usually within a specific field. Um, and so the um, literature on this characterizes this activity as discussing or even arguing about what should be done um, about these potential problems. So what we're talking about here, rather than just identifying problems in this stream, is actually identifying solutions. What solutions are possible um, and what solutions should be thought of as viable and um, pushed forward. And we can think of um, the criteria for survival being 
when they are ready for coupling in this stream. So if we have a policy alternative, it is ready for coupling when we know the technical feasibility of that potential solution, the values underlying um, that potential solution are acceptable um, to most people, certainly within the policy community. Uh, the public has some sort of acquiescence to the need for this policy solution. Um, and the policy solution can be seen as financially viable. Now, of course, the reading talks about how there might be others, maybe that are based on law or path dependency, but the, the four of uh, technical feasibility, value acceptability, public acquiescence, and financial viability are kind of the traditional ones. If we can check those boxes, if we can say a policy proposal um, kind of meets all of those um, criteria, right, if it is seen to be um, acceptable in all of those ways, then and only then is the policy stream ready for coupling. Then we have political stream or the political stream. This is where we think of kind of the traditional governmental actors, whether elected or appointed, bargaining um, and competing for power to try and, you know, get a majority um, in any kind of elected body. And there are three core elements from this political stream that will signal when it is ready to be coupled with the problem stream and a policy stream on any given subject. That includes the national mood, which is extremely hard to measure, right? Uh, we can take polls, but that might not necessarily mean that that is the national mood. Uh, polls are just a sample of one particular response to certain questions or one group's response to certain questions. So um, the national mood is kind of a the idea that a large number of people want something to happen. Interest groups, uh, interest group campaigns that are for or against a certain policy proposal are highly relevant, especially as they are related to the group size and power. Now, this is where you get some crossover because you can have members of policy communities that are in influential interest groups that affect the political stream as well. Finally, you have governments and legislatures. Um, this includes both elected and appointed uh, government officials and their desire to do something um, and to move forward with a potential um, uh, new policy alternative is relevant here as well. Now, in the political stream, not all of the three core elements really need to be synced up. So in the other two, you kind of have to have indicators, focusing events, and feedback all kind of rolling in one direction. Uh, in policy stream, you have to have all of the, the kind of four criteria rolling in the same direction in favor of a policy proposal. In the political stream, you don't necessarily have to have all three um, for the stream to be ready for coupling. That can actually happen after the problem and policy stream come together. But um, the more you have, the more that your, your kind of window of opportunity is likely to open up. The idea behind these streams here is that we have work being done in different areas. And that work is not ready from you know, the initial stages for, for example, for policy entrepreneurs, not for policy entrepreneurs, for people in a policy community to go to the political community and say, this is what we want to have done. Because the background work is just not done there. And maybe the policies, uh, policy alternatives don't meet these various criteria. The framework that it, uh, multiple streams sets up is that there are certain kind of key points at which all of these things can come together. And that when they do, what we experience is a window of opportunity or an opportunity window. Um, things are more likely to happen when we have these windows of opportunity. Um, policy windows are, as Kingdon says, um, and he's the one who ultimately uh, is, is credited with coming up with multiple streams theory, a fleeing opportunity for advocates of proposals to push their pet solutions or to push attention to their special problems. Now, there's a little bit of a distinction here in the literature about an agenda window versus a decision window. Getting something on the agenda um, requires bringing the three streams together, as does getting it ultimately passed. 
Um, but for pr our purposes here, we're probably not as concerned about that. Um, what we are concerned about is what happens when um, one stream is ready and another one is not. Um, or when one stream is ready first. So we can think about things like when the political stream is ready for something to happen, maybe an election has happened or something like that, that changes who's in control of the government. Um, the problem stream needs to couple with it pretty quickly because the opportunity um, is there to seek out new actors who need to sort of prove themselves and need problems to solve to do that. So there's kind of a different uh, flavor of the action there. Whereas the problem stream, if that's the one that opens first, let's say there's a big disaster or focusing event, um, those, you know, kind of people's attention is short in duration. You can't expect them to pay attention for long. So you need a solution right away that fits the way in which the problem has been uh, developed in the public's eye, and that's how you get something on the agenda. A policy entrepreneur or entrepreneurs are needed really to kind of harness this process, um, and these are people that are willing uh, to advocate for a policy solution or a policy alternative by investing their resources, such as time, energy, reputation, money, uh, to promote a certain position on a problem um, or, or a potential solution. Now, this doesn't need to be one individual. Um, this isn't, you know, one person out there saving the world, but it can be, um, it also can be organizations or groups. And they push this policy, their proposals forward in the policy stream, adapt them, and try to find support amongst members in the policy community, and then try and connect that with the political community and also try and find the right moments to bring the problem stream into things as well. In other words, these are the people trying to seize the moment to make a policy uh, window of opportunity happen, right? Trying to connect the indicators to the potential solutions to the governmental state and seize the moment for initiating action. So they're more than advocates. Um, they really are manipulators in a lot of ways of kind of the various problems that exist um, in setting policy. Now, there are a few, um, more than a few here, but there are a few assumptions that we need to kind of keep in mind when we're talking about multiple streams theory or framework. The first is that um, there is ambiguity. This, this assumption of ambiguity exists in MSF. And ambiguity is a state of having many ways of thinking about the same circumstances or phenomena. In other words, there are problem, there are things that exist right now, right? There are kind of the same indicators. We can all look at them and see different things, um, which means that there is not just one rational solution to a given problem. Um, instead, because of this ambiguity, a multitude of solutions may exist to any given problem. It's not uncertainty, which can be cured by more information. It's ambiguity in what is the right thing to do. So ambiguity exists and it is assumed in multiple streams framework. The next is time constraints. Policymakers operate under significant time constraints. Now, these time constraints can arise because processing of the world happens in different ways. Um, problems exist at the same time as potential solutions and also at the same time as government kind of power struggles. Now, our ability to pay attention to these things, though, maybe does not exist in the same parallel way. Instead, we process things more in serial form. In other words, we get one piece of information and then we move on to another. Because this happens, many issues vie for attention. Um, policymakers sense an urgency to address them when they are most visible. So time constraints really limit or put kind of kind of bookends on what can be done and when it can be done. Problematic policy preferences. Now, this doesn't mean problematic in kind of the uh, social justice way, 
But what it means is that policymakers don't have clear preferences about specific policies. Not that they don't have preferences at all, but just we don't always have with the policymakers a notion of um, what should happen at any given point in time. And that's because of this ambiguity and because of these time constraints that these things are in such flux. Therefore, uh, policy preferences may be incomplete we may have, you know, policy actors that have potential solutions for one part of an issue, but not another. And they may be kind of moving in nature. They're hard to pin down. And that makes sometimes politicians uh, subject to the criticism that they are uh, flip floppy or, or uncertain. But that really um, multiple streams framework would argue is kind of just part of part and parcel of the policy world. Unclear technology. Now, this does not mean technology uh, like the iPhone or Android or anything else, uh, but this is uncertainty of how the processes turn into products. Other words, in other words, uncertainty of kind of the jurisdictional boundaries and turf battles that exist within all of these streams. Um, because of this, especially within the, the political stream, um, there's just kind of an extra level of uncertainty that exists overall. Fluid participation. Because there is such turnover in positions in the government uh, or in the politics stream, the composition of decision making bodies is subject to kind of constant change and reshuffling. And this is true regardless of whether we're talking about the bureaucracy or elected office, but certainly the elected office has kind of a, we know. Has, has, has an expiration date. We know when things are going to turn over, whereas with the bureaucracy, people might be there indefinitely. So this kind of assumption is built into the multiple streams framework, wherein we utilize the differences um, sometimes to, to an advantage as a policy entrepreneur. And then stream independence. One of the things that I think is so conceptually interesting, but also somewhat difficult when you first start thinking about MSF, is the fact that independent processes or streams occur at every given point in time, meaning that the politics can change without changing anything in the problem stream at all, and the policy um, stream can change without the problem changing, um, which might you know make some sense when you start to think about why is it that policy solutions haven't kept up maybe with the underlying problem, or why haven't politics kept up with the potential policy solutions that exist? So. You know, when you get in there, it might make more sense. But really, when you're you're seeing this for the first time, I think it's really important to understand that these streams act independently in this theory. Um, and that makes it somewhat difficult to get your hands around. All right, so let's bring it full circle here and sum it all up. I think, you know, what we need to kind of keep in consideration um, it, it is a couple of things. One is that multiple streams framework is one of many theories about how policy making happens. And, you know, you might be having a couple of reactions right now about this framework and saying, this is too confusing, or, you know, this is BS, or I can poke holes in this, or eh, maybe this actually sounds about right, or I can see the usefulness in this. All of those things, plus many more, are valid reactions to it. Um, because this is one of many theories, you may not find this one as persuasive. And as the reading talks about, and I think you should focus about in your reading summaries about, there are limitations to multiple streams framework. There is a reason why there is not one dominant uh, theory of the policy process, and this is it. Um, there are limitations. There are limitations in application and, and in theory and all of that. So that's one part of this. Um, the other is keep in mind that theories of the policy process exist to help us understand what has happened, what is happening, and what will happen. And that means that limitations for each of these theories can occur at any of those stages. So multiple streams framework might be really good at explaining what has happened, but really bad at helping us in the moment 
or predicting what will happen in the future. So it may not kind of make sense, you know, prospectively, but only retrospectively or vice versa, right? All of these theories have kind of those perennial problems that surround them. So I want to make sure to kind of take that step back for a moment and make sure that you understand that. For the discussion circle this week, I I want you to dive in and think about the Flint water crisis. I will post a quick uh, a quick read um, to understanding the Flint water crisis um, so that you have that as a backdrop for those of you who are less well-versed than others. But for a moment, I want you to assume that the Flint water crisis is a focusing event that we can identify as part of this multiple streams framework. Um, and the focusing event is about the problem of lead in water systems in the United States. How would you then, if this is a focusing event, how would you define the, stat, the status of the other streams? What changes have occurred in the other three streams since the start of the crisis? So maybe look at what they were at the time and then what has changed uh, thereafter, right? So um, you might think about things like different legislation that has been passed, different lawsuits that have happened, et cetera. Where do those fall into these different streams? And ultimately, is this framework helpful for understanding what happened with the Flint water crisis and what will happen moving forward? All right, that is it for this week. I look forward to seeing what you put in the discussion circles, and I will see you next week.